Hey, Sheldon. Good Stephen, to see you. Nice to see you again. Hi. I'm Stephen Lipman, professor here at the Anderson School at UCLA in Los Angeles. It's December 17th, 2015. And I'm here to interview Sheldon Ross, professor at USC School of Engineering here in Los Angeles also. And I'm doing this for Informs. So I first met Sheldon back about 1966 when we were both graduate students at Stanford. Sheldon was in the statistics department and I was in the operations research program. And it's a great pleasure to be here and to talk to Sheldon, one of Inform's outstanding scholars. So Sheldon, how you doing? I'm doing well, Steve. It's, it's a pleasure to see you and uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. So let's start off with a bit about your family and your educational background. Uh, and I understand you went to James Madison School in Brooklyn. I did. With uh, Bernie Sanders. I did. So actually, yeah, I'm from Brooklyn, uh, born and, and raised. I went to uh, high school there, as, as Steve just mentioned. I went to James Madison. Uh, Bernie Sanders and I graduated Madison the same, same year. We both went on to Brooklyn College, part of the city college system of New York. Uh, Bernie left after, I think, one year, one year in University of Chicago. Actually, uh, we probably would have been a lot closer than, than we are if it wasn't for you know, one, one unfortunate fact, and uh, that's we never met. I never met the guy. I never knew anything about him. Uh, though I found out afterwards he was a track star there. Huh. But uh, no, I, I didn't know Bernie. I missed the opportunity. So that was high school. That was high school. Uh, basically... From in there, you went to Brooklyn College. Brooklyn College and got a bachelor's degree in mathematics. That's correct. Yeah, basically, uh, in those days in New York, the main idea was you would go to high school and then go to college, and of course, you don't want to pay any tuition. Now, we had a wonderful system with the city colleges where there was tuition was eight dollars a year or eight dollars a semester, I think, was the fees, and so it was always sort of understood that I would go to Brooklyn College one of the city colleges, and I didn't really feel like traveling too far. And so Brooklyn College seemed like a very good place to go. I mean, if you were really smart, I guess you could try to get a scholarship and go to one of the Ivy League schools. But I was never in high school. I was, I was a good student, but I was never that much into trying to get very good grades or anything like that. So I, was, I had good enough grades to go to Brooklyn College, and that's where I went. And $8 per semester... It was eight dollars. Actually, I remember my senior year they raised it from eight to twenty-eight. Ah, and people so were wondering, how am I going to afford this? About the same time, I was a student at UC Berkeley when the tuition was fifty dollars yeah, per those? semester. Now, of course, it's about fourteen thousand dollars for the yeah. year, seven thousand per semester. Those, those, those were the days. I mean, on both coasts, I mean, the other city colleges in New York, you had the University of California here in California. So you majored in math? Majored in mathematics. Uh, found out, I guess, at near the end of my junior year, I didn't really have to go to work afterwards, that they had something called graduate school, which I had never known about. I assumed everyone, basically, you went through four years and you'd get a job maybe as an actuary. I even took the actuarial exam and applied for a summer job one year, though I, though I didn't get it. And then I discovered you can actually go to graduate school. And that's what you did. And that's what I did. I basically had no desire to go to work. You can go to school. They would pay you. Uh, I was really interested in leaving New York. In those days particularly, we're talking about uh, early 1960s. It was kind of a rough place. And the idea of going someplace else for school was very appealing. So you picked up and moved to West Lafayette. I picked up and moved to West Lafayette, though uh, that was not actually my first choice. Uh, I really wanted to go to California. I was had since I was, I don't remember, for the longest time, the, I had this great image of California, and I wanted to go to California, and the University of California, Berkeley, was really where I wanted to be. So I was in mathematics. I, I don't remember, I didn't apply to many places. I applied to Purdue, I think Cornell, and Berkeley. Uh, Purdue offered me a four-year fellowship, a National Defense Education Act fellowship. Cornell, I think, offered me a research assistantship. And Berkeley offered me nothing. Not only nothing, they did not accept me. So uh, I decided that, well, okay, I'd heard good things about Purdue, so I, I went 
to West Lafayette. I was from so, New York, big town. Uh, I decided to leave it, so I decided maybe I'll try a small town, see what it would be like. So you went to West Lafayette, you stayed there and got a master's degree uh, in the yeah. math department. Yes. So you got the foundations there. Yes. And basically what happened at Purdue is I, I went there uh, from the beginning. I liked the university very much. I liked my classes, very much like my classmates. And I was there maybe about a month, and I, I remember sort of saying to myself, uh, you got to get out of here. I mean, the town was very, very slow. It, uh, I'm sure things have changed over the years, but coming from New York, how quickly things moved in West Lafayette was very slow. And then I had discovered I had taken, I guess, in my senior year in, in, at Brooklyn College, I took a class in probability. And I took a class in statistics my first semester at Purdue, and I discovered that uh, there was a department of statistics. And also that there was this other university out in Northern California, for some reason I liked Northern, uh, which I'd never heard of a year earlier, but it turned out to be a very strong university that seemed to be getting stronger all the time, according to some article. And this was this Leland Stanford Junior University. And they had a statistics department. So since Berkeley had rejected me in mathematics and I really wanted to go to California, I decided to apply to Stanford in statistics. Uh, fortunately, I was admitted, and I went and never left California. So you started Stanford in 1964 in the statistics department. Yes. And you graduated four years later. Yes. And so tell us about your four years at Stanford, and then towards the end, maybe we'll segue into how you selected a, a thesis advisor, a crucial decision for any graduate student. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, Stanford, was, I guess, was very influential to me. It, uh, it was this great intellectual place, but at the same time, it was like, had like a country club atmosphere. Really? I mean, well, I think it was being out in California, there was a golf course on campus, there was a lake on campus, it was just, uh, you would get up and uh, it would be sunny outside, it just seemed uh, like a different world. Idyllic. It seemed very, very idyllic. Uh, statistics from the beginning I, I enjoyed, actually. The, the nice thing with me, and, and I think in both mathematics and statistics, is that I never had initially a passion it wasn't that I sort of loved mathematics and I just, no, I, 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 it was easy, it came easiest to me of all the things that I had taken. And I liked it enough, but the, the more I went along, the more I studied, the more I got to enjoy it. And that became true also with statistics, where I the more, just got more and more interested as I went along. But there was a problem, and that the problem was is any time I was taking sort of the advanced classes, I didn't like so much that area. And what had happened was, it, to going into the question about uh, thesis and all that, is that the end of the second year at Stanford in statistics, they would have a qualifying exam. And this was a big exam. Basically, if you pass this exam, you were going to get your PhD. It might take a while, but you're going you're to get it. So uh, the graduate students would throw a party at the end of the second year, those who took the exam. And at this party, which we threw, I met this one professor who I never met before because he actually, even though it was in statistics, had a joint appointment uh, with the new operations research department. In fact, I'm not sure they were a department yet. They were not. They were a division. A program at that program. time. And he became the first chair. And this was Jerry Lieberman. And I never met Jerry before, but we, I met him then and we talked. And it turned out that we had grown up in the same neighborhood. And in fact, uh, Jerry went to James Madison High School also, a little before me. And I, that, just, that was, I met him. And then I went off to Europe that summer, uh, caught a cold at some point, was in London, and I caught a very bad cold and decided I'm going to come back early. So I came back. I, I went out uh, to Stanford. And it was about a month before the semester began, the quarter began. And I thought, gee, it might be nice if somebody would pay me some money to do something. So I went looking for people that I knew in the stat department. And the first guy I looked for, the uh, department chair, his name was Herb Solomon, was out of town. And then there was a man, Lincoln Moses, who had either was, had been the department chair, and he was out of town. And then I remembered Jerry. 
Uh, and that's the same guy that of Hillier and Lieberman, that yes. really famous OR textbook. Yes, yeah, Jerry, though it had, it had not been written yet. That came a little bit later. So I, I knocked on uh, Jerry Lieberman's door and uh, told him my story that I'd come back and I wonder if he needed someone to do some research for him. Uh, and he said, uh, come back tomorrow, I'll let you know. So I came back tomorrow and it turned out that, and he said, okay, I decided uh, I will hire you. And as luck would have it, uh, Cy Derman was visiting that summer. Cy and Jerry had done a bunch of work and Cy was really an expert in dynamic programming. And they had written a, a paper in dynamic programming and Jerry wanted me to uh, write up a numerical example for the, for the paper, which turned out not to be as straightforward as it sounds. Uh, and I remember so doing it and getting involved and reading the paper and really enjoying thinking about it and doing that. And at the end of the summer, Jerry asked me, uh, uh, how did you like it? And I said, I really like it. It's, it just seems like a really fun area. And he said, well, do you want to work with me? And I said, yeah, I'd love to. And so Jerry said, well, here's what you have to do. He gave me uh, this one stack of papers. And so incidentally, <laughs> at that point, you had really chosen a dissertation advisor, and you'd kind of fallen into it. Yes, by chance, so totally by chance. this was not a chance. very deliberative process. Not at all. No, I had no, I, first of all, I had no idea what dynamic programming was beforehand, what operations research was beforehand. It was just totally random, sort of running into Jerry, uh, at that party, talking to him, finding out that he was from Brooklyn. And so I felt comfortable, even though I didn't know him, going to ask him, you know, if he wanted to support me that last month. And the fact that he was working on something which I found so interesting. So it was very random. And at that time, of course, you didn't realize how important this decision was to choose him as your advisor. Choosing any person uh, is a, it made for a, a graduate difference. student yeah. is almost crucial. It, it impacts your dissertation, of course, and it impacts your future career. Very much so, very much so. Uh, as I said, uh, well, as I said, Jerry told me to uh, read, give me this one batch of papers. They were by Cy Derman, said, read these papers. Gave me another batch by David Blackwell. He said, read these papers. And then he said, the third thing you have to do is take Pete Vinot's uh, dynamic programming class in the fall, ah. which is where we met. If you recall, we were both in that class. A few other people a who very did very hard well class. did very well in that class. It was just it was a wonderful class, and I really totally got into uh, the dynamic programming. And Sai suggested a problem with average cost dynamic programming, and that became my thesis. Wow! And it really, I mean, it's and as you say about the importance of a thesis advisor, and in my case when it came about to looking for a job because Jerry had the joint appointment in both operations research and statistics. And the truth of the matter is I wanted to stay in California. And my ideal place would be to go to Berkeley. Ideally, uh, I guess in the staff department, but it turned out there was an opening in operations research. So because of Jerry, I applied for that job. And uh, luckily I was hired. And by the by, I noticed, since I saw your CV recently, you and Jerry wrote, I believe, 14 papers. Uh, yeah, it was, it was very interesting. Uh, uh, yeah, we, we became very friendly. I think from the beginning, uh, Jerry treated me as a friend. It took me a little while, I think, until after I got my PhD, and even there probably took another year before I could sort of relate to Jerry as a friend. He was always sort of, in my mind, Professor Lieberman, even though I call him Jerry. Uh, Jerry went off to uh, London. I guess I had been at Berkeley a, a couple of years. It was probably about 1970. And Jerry was on sabbatical in London. And he said, why don't you come join me? I have research funds. Uh, why don't you take off a quarter? At Berkeley, we were on the quarter system of the time. It's some a few years later, we changed to semester. And it turned out if you taught during the summer, you could uh, take, you could manage to get six months off. And so I took off to go to London and work with Jerry. And uh, so I was working on this problem at the time, and I had a conjecture. Uh, it was called a sequential assignment problem. We eventually wrote a paper. And the, the idea was you had people 
and jobs would come by sequentially, and you had to decide which one of your people to assign to that job. And a job had a value, the value was X coming from some distribution, and your people had values sort of P1 through Pn, if you had N people, and these were kind of the probabilities they would be able to do the job. And so if you assigned a P person to an X job, you have an expected return of P times X. And so the problem was to maximize the total expected return. And obviously, if the job coming in had a large enough value, you would want to assign your best person. Uh, not obvious, but that was pretty intuitive. When the person finished the job, were they available no, to do the No, they're finished. Once they're, they, done. Okay. they're done. Once the people are assigned, that's, that's the end of it. And so the conjecture was is that how, you know, whether or not you assign your best person to, if you have n people who still remain unassigned, depend on the value of the job, but not the, not the p of the person. In other words, if somebody was the best person, it didn't make a difference by how much they were the best or exactly how good they were. Mm. If the x value was large enough, you would assign them. So that was a conjecture. Uh, and I worked on it, Jerry and I worked, we, we, we couldn't prove it. And so then, as luck would have it, Cy Derman was also on sabbatical, and he had been skiing in Austria. And he was visiting Jerry in London. And I had met Cy briefly that summer, that, since he was visiting Jerry, but we weren't at all friendly or anything. Uh, but uh, we picked up Jerry, Cy, and we were in a cab going to Piccadilly Circus. And Jerry said, tell Cy your conjecture. So in the cab, I explained the problem and told Cy the conjecture. And Cy thought for a moment, he said, I don't think it's true, but if it is, Hardy's dilemma should prove it. So as, as luck would have it, I, I knew what Hardy's dilemma was. I mean, I say as luck, as, this is not like today. Today you would go home, you would look on the internet, uh, you know, Google Hardy's dilemma, you have Hardy's. <coughs> but back then, we didn't have that. And so if, you know, if you didn't have 101 books in, you know, your house, you wouldn't be able to figure out what Hardy's dilemma until the next day or so, or going to the library. But with a bit of luck, I knew Hardy's dilemma. It was a very simple letter if you have numbers A1 through AN, B1 through BN, and then you want to pair them up, an A and a B, and you want to maximize the sum of the products. You should pair the best A with the best B, the second best A with the second best B, and very straightforward to prove by induction, Hardy's lemma. And I went back, and uh, sure enough, Hardy's lemma worked. So Cy, Cy was indeed correct that Hardy's lemma worked, and we wrote a paper. And that started us off. I mean, every year for the next 10 years, I mean, we were the three of us, Derman, Lieberman, and Ross, we wrote a paper together. It was a lot of fun. Uh, I think some of those papers were quite nice. Some of those papers, well, we wrote a paper. You know, but it was, it was just kind of fun. So I would come out to visit during summer times, visit Jerry at Stanford. I would be in Berkeley. I would go down, you know, once or twice a week. And we just had a hell of a lot of fun writing it. Wow. Yeah. But I know you, you wrote papers with Jerry for about 20 years. Oh, well, not quite 20, Jerry. Uh, near the end, Jerry became more of an administrator. He, Jerry had a remarkable career. He was the chair of the OR department, and then he had a job in the dean's office, and then he became dean. Jerry was the dean of engineering and eventually became provost. Yes. And so Jerry... Uh, got more and more into uh, administrative, really important, high-level administrative uh, jobs at Stanford. And so uh, you know, it was mainly those 10 years, I'd say, from 1970 to 1980. And there, were, there was probably a paper before and maybe a paper or so afterwards. But those years, we, we did a lot of joint work together. And then you were at USC as a professor in the IE and OR department. No, Berkeley. Not I mean, USC. Berkeley. Yeah, yeah, at Berkeley. Sorry about that. Yeah. And... Um, how was that time there? Oh, Berkeley's a wonderful place. Uh, I mean, I had been right all along for wanting to go to University of California, Berkeley. It, uh, it was a magnificent place. Uh, I, I loved being there. I, I loved Berkeley. I loved uh, the fact it was close to San Francisco. It, it itself was a great city. And the university was wonderful. And you had great colleagues. Colleagues were great. The department was terrific. I mean, I just... Students uh, were good. Students were very good. Students were very good. It was just, uh, it really was, 
I, I must say, I, I, never, I never really had ever thought I would ever leave. But 36 years later, yeah. you decided to venture out and see a different part of California. Yeah. And you accepted an offer at USC in the School of Engineering to become a chaired professor. Yes. And now you've been there for 11 years. Uh, yes, yeah, 2004. Yeah, actually, uh, I always thought Berkeley was sort of the, the best place in the world to be. I but mean, I really thought something that. must have encouraged you to make that move. Well, what happened was uh, I discovered there were other great places. I mean, in going in from 1963, when I left New York City, till uh, 2000 or so, New York changed. And also, I think a lot of the great things about uh, New York are not something you can appreciate when you're a college age. I mean, all the great restaurants, the great cultural events, none of these things I took advantage of when I, w when I was living there. But in later years, when I would go back, because my family was still there, so I would always visit over the years, it just seemed to get nicer and nicer. And also seemed like a much safer place than it had been back in the 60s. And uh, I used to go to New York a lot because I would go visit my daughter, Rebecca, who was an undergraduate at Harvard. And I would actually go to New York first and see my, my family there, and then I would go visit Reb at Harvard. And I also fell in love with uh, Cambridge and Boston. And I decided that, uh, I don't, wouldn't say maybe they're as great as Berkeley, but there are other great places, both New York and Cambridge. And I got the idea in my mind, well, gee, maybe, maybe when I got to be 60 years old, I should maybe try to go someplace else. Uh, University of California has a very nice pension system, to be quite honest about it. And so the idea of maybe retiring from there at 60, I had no intention of actually retiring, retiring, but going to teach someplace else in a great place. Uh, and I was thinking New York or Boston. And as it happened, and there was some contact I had those places, but as it happened, at around that same time, I got a pamphlet in the mail from University of Southern California saying they've just received a donation uh, by Daniel Epstein, and they are looking for someone to fill the Daniel Epstein chair in industrial and systems engineering. So on a whim, because I really had no interest in Los Angeles, I didn't have any real positive feel for it, and it had been many years since I had visited LA, I decided I'll apply. Uh, I had, after a while, I was invited to go down and visit. I was very, very pleasantly surprised at uh, the interesting things that were going on at USC and in the department. Uh, and also, uh, I spent a few nights uh, staying in a hotel in Santa Monica, which I decided was a lovely place to live. And so uh, when they eventually made me an offer, I decided, well, let me, let me try it. Now, it, it, I thought that they were unhappy that I was leaving at Berkeley. Which, and I thought that if it didn't work out, I probably could go back. I figured I had probably up to maybe five years to go back if it didn't work out. But I liked it from the beginning. I mean, LA was really, I mean, I had this image, I don't know why, that uh, sometimes one has in Northern California, that Southern California is all like similar to maybe Orange County. It's all very, oh, I don't know, very Republican. I'm more, I'm like somebody you might expect who's from Brooklyn and from Berkeley. And, you know, Los Angeles is not. Los Angeles is very diverse, with very diverse opinions, which is, I, th I enjoy very much. Los Angeles has all these cultural attractions that uh, are not, they're not given credit for in Northern California. And uh, it seemed like a really nice place. So I decided to come. Uh, the other thing is my, both my daughters were at a time when they didn't really need me anymore. One had graduated college, the other one was off to college. Uh, and it seemed like a very good time to maybe make a move. So I came, so and it's came. been terrific. Um, so tell me something about your students. So we talked a bit about your being a student of Jerry Lieberman. Yes. How about your students? Because you've had some well-known students. Oh, I've had some, yeah, exceptional students, I would say, over the years. Uh, first at Berkeley and, and now uh, at USC. Uh, some of the people are who are probably very well known. Uh, Mike Pinedo was a student of mine. Mike was the uh, 
quite a few years was the chair in the business school, I guess the operations group in the business school at uh, NYU. And uh, yeah, Michael was a student, I can't remember dates, I would guess somewhere in the 80s, probably in the early 80s or so of mine at Berkeley. Uh, and he and I did some joint work, not, not, not a lot. Actually, in those days, even though you did a lot of, I did very hands-on work, I think, with my students, but you generally didn't write papers with them. The papers were generally their own papers. There was, but nowadays, it seems to change a bit that nowadays, most PhD students write papers with their advisor as even part of the PhD thesis. Uh, then it was pretty much, you know, you would encourage them to go off and really be able to write it themselves so that you get the skill not only in the research but also the writing ability, which is, is really very, very important. But Michael has done really well. He originally went to, well, he went to Columbia and then he went to NYU. Uh, Rhonda Ryder was another student of mine. Rhonda is, uh, went off to uh, Santa Clara to getting her PhD and was, did really well there and was hired back by Berkeley, my old department at Berkeley. In fact, she was uh, the chair of the department until a couple of years ago. And she was chair for about three or five years. I don't know which one, but Rhonda's done really well and uh, has had a big impact. Uh, other students of mine, Errol Pecos is probably the one that I've done the most joint work with. And Errol was one of these guys. I mean, students can be a lot of work where they can save you a lot of time. Errol was one that saved me a lot of time. Uh, I, I'm kind of lazy. And a Sheld lot of times... Sheldon says he's lazy, <laughs> but in some high 40 years, since 1968, he's written over 100 and... I believe it's 150 papers and 11 books, 13 uh, books, 13 books. Uh, one of them is in the 11th edition. Yeah. And and another one's in the 9th edition, a couple in the 5th uh -huh. edition. So... Uh, Lazy, I don't know. Well, maybe not late. Well, well, actually, well, I'm pretty good when I get started working, but it's hard to get me started. And so a lot of, so basically there are times when you, you see something that people have done, and you say, that really looks like it's interesting. But it's hard to force yourself into reading it. And so Errol, I would say, Errol, go off and read this and come and report to me. And he, he was fantastic. He would go off and read it. He would come to report to me. And his report was usually a lot clearer than the original paper. And in that way, I remember there was, I had him read something about the, uh, something called the Azuma Inequality, Martin, it's the Azuma Martingale Inequality by Blackwell. And Blackwell had a strengthening of Azuma's Martingale Inequality, and I, he explained it to me, and actually a week later I wrote a little paper on it. So that, and he explained, explained to me uh, the, for the very first time Stein's method in, uh, Estimate, not estimating, in, yield, in the, uh, determining the error of Poisson approximations. And uh, yeah, so Errol was just really an ideal student. We've done a lot of joint work together ever since he's gone. He, he finished up, and Errol's now full professor at Boston University. Uh, had other students, Kyle Lynn, who is a tenured professor at uh, uh, Monterey, Monterey Postgraduate School. I have a couple of more recent students at USC, Babak Haji, who just got his PhD, is now as a postdoc at Columbia. I expect big things out of Babak. One of the nice things about Babak is that uh, uh, when I went to Berkeley, my very first student was uh, a man named uh, Sabeti. Mm. Saying Sabeti. Yeah. Actually, his name is Sabeti. And his best friend was Rasul Haji. And both these guys were uh, basically finishing up when I first went to Berkeley. And uh, Rasul was getting his PhD with uh, Gordon Newell, who was teaching in transportation at the time. Well, Babak, who's my student, was actually the son of Rasul. So it was kind of nice having a second generation. And Samim Gabami is another one of recent, my recent students, now works at the Federal Reserve in Washington. I expect big things over the years in some memes. So I've had a lot of very good students. How I'm missing you, a lot of them. How did you pick the areas in which you did your research? I understand that you started off and Jerry Lieberman gave you a problem and then that led to a lot of other problems. Now I noticed that there was a graduate student at Stanford with you, Mark Brown, and you and he have written, looks like a dozen or so papers. 
and they all have the word coupons <laughs> in their title. Yeah. Uh, yeah, actually, uh, Jerry led me on to dynamic programming, which from the beginning I liked a lot. It was kind of a really a, a lot of fun. You sort of... Uh, you have these problems you could you can generally understand. You could say what's the optimal policy, uh, sort of like what you do in store. Well, you did so much in dynamic programming yourself. You know that. And uh, so for me, there are a lot of fun problems. And so I, I liked from the beginning, and that was what I did my thesis on. That's I would say the first five years afterwards, I primarily worked in in dynamic programming. But I was always interested in probability, and so uh, I would teach probability, I would teach probability models, and so you know, probabilistic analysis of different models was always something which also was of interest. Uh, at some point I was asked to teach a class in simulation, some beautiful probability arguments in simulation, and so everything was sort of revolved, I would say, about probability. And I always liked problems. Uh, well, Mark and I roomed together in graduate school, so we were friends from graduate school. And both of us really enjoy doing probability. And I enjoy problems where you don't need a lot of technique, where you don't need a lot of sort of mathematical knowledge, but you just sort of, well, sometimes you get a clever idea and you can solve the problem. And there are a lot of kind of nice problems in the probability, like coupon collecting problems. You know, you just keep on collecting. There are coupons of different types. The classical problem is you, uh, each coupon is any one of n types, equally likely to be any one of those types. How many coupons do you have to collect until you have a complete set of at least one of each sort type? Sort of like trading cards? Yeah, exactly like cards. Exactly like, like cards, like if you have baseball cards. Yes. And you wanted to get at least one of each Dodger. Uh, but like baseball cards, I mean, in reality, they're not equally likely to be any one of the 26 baseball players of those days. Uh, the stars were harder to get. There were few of them. And so the more realistic problem is that uh, you, each one, each of the n types has its own probability. And then you want to know how many to get a complete set, and that's a more interesting problem. And not so trivial, and a lot of sort of variations of it. And actually, I've written a bunch of papers on coupons. A bunch of papers on, on coupon collecting. Well, you've written a bunch of papers, as I... Th I I don't know how many people would say 150 papers is a bunch. It's a gross. Yes. And, um, but you also wrote all those books. And how did you come to mix the books with the papers? And, and of course, then in the end, which has had the bigger impact? Or, or how do the books have a big impact? So undergraduates, they know professors in schools by the textbooks. But for people who have PhDs, they're not thinking about the textbooks as much, but you clearly decided to do a lot of textbook writing. Yeah, I, you know, I, I would say it's almost also by chance. I, at Stanford, uh, all the exams were take-homes, and uh, also you had weekly problem sets. And I, I kind of remember, you know, writing up the solution of a problem set or an exam problem and writing it up and sort of reading what I had written. And it wasn't what I wanted to say. It was very, and I would sort of start all over again. And I did that a lot. And I, I, it must have caught on. So at some point, it seemed to be I, I got the ability to write clearer. than I got. So Billy, I didn't realize I even had. Uh, and then what happens when I went to Berkeley, they asked me to teach a class well, two classes. One was in stochastic processes, and one was related to my thesis, dynamic programming. And so what I did is I wrote up notes. And it turned out there was no real book that sort of had the material I wanted to do. And I wrote up notes, and I asked Jerry, uh, Jerry Lieberman, said, Jerry, you know, I have these notes. What do you think I should do with them? And Jerry says, well, I've just become editor of a book of a book publishing firm. Bob, the editor it was Holden Day. They since went out of business. And uh, he said, why don't you write up? We'll publish it as a book in the series. Jerry was the editor of the series. And I did that. And in those days, it was real fast. I mean, actually, it seemed like to me every, took me like a week to write a chapter. And every draft was the final draft. I mean, it was very fast. And nowadays, it's become much, much slower. And it became like a way of life. Then a few years later, I sort of rewrote the stochastic process. So that first book, 
First book. That was probability models. Applied probability with models with optimization applications. And it, uh, it had some impact, and actually uh, more so than Europe than here. The Europeans seem to like it, and I sort of become more well-known in Europe I, as a result of that book. Uh, but, a, but afterwards, I sort of rewrote it. I wrote this introduction to probability models. Uh, and it became sort of a way of life. I, I went off to Columbia one year on, uh, on leave. I was visiting Soy, and they wanted me to teach a probability class. And I ended up writing, putting together notes on probability. And I eventually wrote a probability book on the notes. And it just became sort of a way of life. Uh, looking back, it's hard to understand how I did it. Uh, so it's very hard to get started, but once I can get started, I'm pretty good. And but uh, so it, it, I started writing books, and it started be I would decide I would teach a class. So so I can see that it was three papers a year and a book every three years. Uh -huh. uh, pretty much. Yeah, I was pretty active for a while. That's pretty more than pretty while. active. Uh, but you asked a question about the research and the books and the impact. Uh, I was a pretty good researcher. I, I think I still am. I think I'm probably as good as I ever was. But I don't think I was a fantastic researcher. I think if, I mean, some of the papers, are, I think, have had some impact. But if I didn't do it, the world wouldn't be any different. Well, the world wouldn't be any different if I didn't do the books either. But I think the books have more of an impact. I think uh, the books have been used in a lot of places. I think uh, people have appreciated them. And the style was, in some ways, unique. I think the probability model style, I think, was a lot was probabilistic in nature. So, I mean, going there, there have been some people who, well before me, have written great books on probability, like William Feller. I mean, the classic book is Feller's books, but Feller's books got it advanced quickly, and I think I, I sort of continued on with this more in the elementary style, thinking of probability as coin flipping rather than as sort of measure theory. And uh, you know, so I think it's had an impact. So I'd go with the books. I would say the books have had much more impact than my papers, which, uh, you know, and even my papers, I think, the ones that I've enjoyed the most are probably are not ones that get cited very often. So it, uh, you never know. So uh, seeing as I'm your contemporary, and as I'm getting a little older, I'm, I'm thinking, well, Maybe tonight I'll watch a TV program rather than continue to beat my head against the wall on some problem. And while I've written quite a few, somewhere around 80 papers, I haven't written 150, nor have I written 13 books, some of them with so many additions. And I look to see, well, when faculty get older, their productivity tends to drop. But yours hasn't dropped at all. Perhaps it's even increased. How do you explain that? Uh. Okay, going, going to the first thing about hitting your head against the wall. One of the things is that I've, I've never thought of myself as being the brightest guy around. I mean, I, I was bright, and, I got, and the nice thing is I seemed to get better as I went along. But if I couldn't solve a problem, that was okay. I mean, there were people who were smart, and if they can't solve it, it really bothers them. I was never quite that way. I mean, I would look at a problem and try to look at it maybe differently, than maybe, and sometimes come up with a clever solution. But if I didn't, okay, that's the end of it. I didn't mind dropping a problem. Uh, well, I think you know, as far as productivity continuing on, uh, part of it, of course, I think is, is moving to, to USC. I mean, being at a new place, you don't want to go there and just think, well, OK, not do anything. I mean, I, I probably could have not done anything if I was still at Berkeley and still been appreciated uh, for maybe what I had done before. But I think coming to USC, you don't want to seem like you come there and you so retire. So it's rejuvenating. Oh, uh, re re well, I mean, motivating. Motivating. I would say more mot motivating that you do want to keep on going. But I think the most important thing in my case, as it's always been, is it's still fun. Uh, for me, research is fun. I mean, I think maybe maybe it's the sort of problems I work on. Uh, and you can't just go by numbers. I mean, I might have written 150 papers. You've written 80 papers. Uh, your 80 papers, you know, what's a paper? You know, you take a, one, of your 80 pa one of your 80 papers, I could write that maybe as three papers. I mean, so what's a paper? I mean, the, how many co-authors did you have? How much work you did? You know, it's, uh, you, you can't count numbers. Uh, but research has always kind of been, for me, fun. I've enjoyed the problems where you, 
there's kind of, you know, say you could sort of think about it, maybe come up with something clever, get intuition. And my exercise is mainly walking. And I love to walk, and I love to have a problem. When I have a research problem, I love to sort of walk and pull out the problem and think about it. That makes walking fun. When I don't have a research problem, which happens so, you know, a reasonable part of the time also, you know, I, I walk, but I'm looking at my watch. This, gee, it's only been five minutes. But when I have a research problem or I have someone I'm talking to, it's a lot of fun. So for me, research is still fun. Uh, fortunately, teaching is still fun. You know, it's just so it, uh, you know, I'm just keep on going. So here it's you good. are, nearly 50 years post-PhD. That's amazing, yeah. And you haven't slowed down a bit, and you intending to keep going and... At least another 10 years, I think. Another 10. At least another 10, and then we'll see. Uh, Fortunately, uh, I seem to have good genes. Uh, unfortunately, my dad passed away this past year, but he was 102 years old and uh, had been pretty much healthy the whole time. Uh, my mom is 96, and uh, she's kind of weak, but she's still hanging in there. So, I mean, I, I seem to have good genes, and uh, I enjoy it. I try to exercise. I try to you know, eat well, and uh, it's fun. I mean, I think, uh, to me... Being a university professor is always, for the most part, been research and teaching. I mean, we all have to do uh, some administrative things, some things that are not always so much fun that you just have to do to do your share. But the main thing has been research and teaching. And for me, you know, we put in a lot of hours sometimes because it's, it's a lot of fun. So it's been a lot of fun talking to you and interviewing here Thank you. today. And it's interesting to hear how somebody who so many students have read your books and like how did this all come about so if um, it's been fun but if you were to give a piece of advice or two pieces of advice to young assistant professors or graduate students what would you tell them uh, advice to okay so it's, it's a little different I think uh, say a graduate student who uh, I think the job opportunity is good these days in our fields. So I think, uh, I mean, in some fields, I think you would want to tell your graduate student that you don't have to be a professor to have an interesting and fun life. Uh, but I think if that's the direction that they want it to go, I would say, well, you know, there, there is, there's more pressure these days than when I started. Uh, one of the great things about University of California, and particularly Berkeley, maybe all of you you see, I don't know, uh, was at least when I was there, what counted was scholarship, even in engineering. Uh, nowadays in engineering, there's certainly a lot of pressure on young people to get research grants, uh, bring in money to the university. That was, when I was at Berkeley, that never was an issue. I mean, I was there during the days of the Vietnam War when the, prim most, the primary uh, supporter of academic research and, say, statistics, operations research, was the Department of Defense. And there were many people who decided on principle they would not accept money from the Department of Defense. But they continued doing research. I mean, uh, you know, in science, it's tough. If you don't have a grant, you have to run a lab. But if in, in mathematics, mathematics-related fields, pencil and paper was all we needed. And so people did, and I don't think there were any, we were, none of them were hurt academically. It never came up, you know, when the people came up with promotion uh, that they don't have research grants, as long as they had research papers. Nowadays, in a lot of places, you have to have research grants. Uh, so I would tell them, even though, you know, this is the case, do, the, do what you're interested in. Do the research. I mean, to me, I went into academia because the big advantage academia had over industry, and there were good industrial places to work in those days also, Bell Labs, IBM, was in academia, you could choose your problems. You could work on what interests you. And I never felt, thought of myself as being, in general, a great problem solver. I was good at working on a certain type of problem, and those are the ones that interested me. And those are the ones that were fun to think about. And if you have a problem, if you're doing research, and it's not fun to think about, and you're forcing yourself to do it, to, you're not going to get that far. So my advice would be to, uh, research-wise, pick an area which you really enjoy, and then, then stay with it. 
You know? If you do that, you might write 150 papers and 13 books. Oh. That would be great. Sheldon, it was Thank great. you so much, Steve. This has been a pleasure. Great talking to you today. Thank you. And um, inspiration for uh, researchers and students. So, so thanks very much. Thank you.